everyone here knows the West Australian story over the last few years. Uh, I, I describe it briefly. Uh, we've had basically had the largest growth uh, phase, accumulation of capital and wealth in Australia's history. $600 billion invested in mainly the resource sector and associated infrastructure. 30% increase in population, uh, mainly from overseas. 30% uh, increase in household wealth. 40% soon increase in GSP. It's been phenomenal. Uh, over a very short term, driven by China, or the growth of China either directly or indirectly. Uh, we're very lucky. And it set a Western Australia up for generations to come, a step change in our wealth. Uh, and uh, it was, if you wish, the accumulation or just get it done phase. Most of us were around during that period uh, when BHP Rio Chevron just tried to get the investment in the ground. BHP were hoarding workers, importing from everywhere. Wage rates were going up, hard to get things done on time and on cost. We all wish it continued. It, uh, never, it was always coming to an end. It had to be based on projects. State government did essentially the same thing. We had to respond to a 30% increase in population. We had to respond to loss in uh, inadequate numbers of teachers, nurses, doctors, and, and, and others. Uh, we had to respond also to the mining sector kind of jacking up wages and pulling people from us. We also had to uh, respond to a backlog of capital and investment and a backlog of investment in the public sector. So we were in the accumulation phase uh, like the private sector. We did it. Uh, and we invested very heavily. Uh, we all knew that this was going to come to an end and it would be hard to swallow. I describe it as swallowing a pumpkin. More painful going out than coming in and painful going in, I assure you of that. Uh, and uh, it was hard, but it was good, and we did it, and there were some costs along the way. Uh, but it, even if commodity prices had held up, we were going to see private business investment that was driving all this, which typically ran at 15 to 20 billion a year, went to 75. And it was going to come down. Projects do in. We're a commodity, project-based economy. They were going to come in, and they employ a lot of people and spend a lot during the... Uh, construction phase, during the operational phase, it's a fraction of that. We were going to experience a downsizing, a down pace of the economy, a shifting of gear, three gears at a time. It's always going to be difficult. And then the commodity gods hit us. Now, I know there's some Nostradamuses out there that saw this coming. Uh, most of them, by the way, saw it coming after it came. But uh, Unfortunately, uh, uh, where were you when I needed you? Uh, and uh, and I, the old statement is, you could have made a lot of money by joining BHP and tell them that they were going to lose seven plus billion dollars this year and don't buy shale gas in the U.S. But anyways, we deal with that. Uh, and we are a state basic, uh, we're a state economy based on commodities and over our time we became, as an income, more and more relied directly on iron ore royalties in particular. It went from 4% of our revenue to 25. And of course, our major tax is payroll, and who pays payroll tax? The big side of town, those doing those investing. And we, like BHP, Woodside, uh, everybody in our sector, have been hit with uh, sharp drops in revenue. Sharp drops in revenue. The largest cut in revenue any government has experienced in Australia since the Great Depression. What do you do? Well, that's what I ask myself at night. Change your name. <laughs> Doctor the data. Hmm, whatever. Anyways, and once I came on uh, as treasurer, uh, I think this Troy had a plan. Uh, and 1415, uh, iron ore prices were about hundred dollars a ton, and they haven't. They. Well, I think they've dropped, well, they dropped again today. Uh, they went from 100 to, I think it's about $49 uh, a ton. And then along the way, our second major uh, commodity, uh, oil dropped through the floor. Uh, where were the Nostradamuses when I needed them? Anyways, we've uh, experienced over the last two years a writing down of $17.8 billion. Uh, quite a bit. 
and, and uh, our GST, which I will whinge about towards the end, hasn't helped us. In fact, it's dropped. The shares drop, 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 and will drop in the reported drop in the next budget. Those people in the Commonwealth Grants Commission, uh, most of them don't live in WA, and it's good reason they would be tarred and feathered. But anyways, we get to that. We had to respond. We responded in a whole range of ways. People don't give us credit for this, but Troy in particular, uh, in, uh, since this term of government, has have put in a raft of efficiency measures. In fact, we have, uh, we've had 17.9% recline in revenue since my two bud budgets. I put in efficiency measures of $7.5 billion and a whole raft of uh, voluntary, uh, voluntary uh, uh, redundancies. 3,000, some 3,600 people. We created this new kind of bureaucratic term, uh, agency if, uh, expenditure reviews, basic zero base budgeting. Go down to basis and roll in it throughout the public sector. Uh, some public servants like it, some of it's, it's very difficult. Uh, recruitment freezer is in place now, a very difficult and second, third, fourth order process, but we have to do it. And we also reduced, uh, 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 done uh, efficiency measures of all sorts of measures. Throughout, over the last four years, we pulled $24 billion out of the forward estimates. Uh, significant change, more so than any government in West Australia's history, except perhaps the court government in 96. Significant one. We also introduced a wages policy. During the previous period, we did pay high wages, and i go through that in a minute. We needed that to get in one. And at the start of the boom in 2004 or 5, Western Australia's public servants, particularly the frontline services, were amongst the lowest paid in the nation. Now they are the highest paid. We increased wages. But since 2013 uh, 14, we pegged wages at the CPI. Uh, and uh, I will make, we made an announcement yesterday. We will, I will go through that a little bit th more thoroughly. And this, what this happened is this is the growth rate. The, bottom gray area is CPI, inflation rate. Uh, you notice that uh, teachers in particular, and this is top teachers, uh, have seen a effectively a 75% increase in their income and in wage. They also get add-ons uh, of various types. So we, we've increased the wage of senior teachers by 75% over the last 10 years. Uh, and uh, teach, uh, police constables uh, by over 55%. And uh, registered nurses, uh, about the same level, senior public servants, uh, not as high. Uh, we did that as a statement of policy. I'm not running away from this. In fact, people ask me, what, what did you do with the boom income here? Capital, we did a large amount of capital expansion, which I would go into, but most of that was borrowed or funded through uh, our PTEs. Western Power and Water Corp and others, and some of it in Main Roads was with the Commonwealth. By far, the largest growth of, of use of that temporary, as it proved, revenue went into public servants, went into the wages and conditions, and made them the highest paid in the country. That's the data. Teachers uh, in Western Australia, that's the dark blue line. Look at it relative to Victoria, some 25 to 30 percent above senior teachers in Victoria. Uh, and uh, police and nurses and uh, orderlies and uh, doctors, you name it, we're the highest paid. Not, not shrinking from that, but look around the private sector. Up until recently, the same could be said about every position in every major firm in Western Australia, engineers, geophysicists, or whatever. Indeed, in my electorate, uh, I was told by the owners of the McDonald's hamburger stands that their uh, employees are, this was two years ago, the highest paid in the world, adjusted for PPP inflation, uh, interest, uh, exchange rate differentials, highest paid in the world. We were a, a costly place, and it was a costly place to live, and we needed to get frontline services, and that, as a government, we did it. Uh, and uh, so we pay them well, I'm not lamenting that. The challenge is to continue to do that, uh, to continue to pay them as, as well, and also live within our means. That's hard. Here's what we did. Uh, it wasn't just us. The previous government actually, on average, increase of 8.8% uh, over their period of seven years. 8.8% annual growth, average growth, rather, of uh, salaries. Salaries includes wages and other conditions. 
Ours has been 6.9%, substantially above other states, substantially above uh, 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 lower than the previous years, but substantially higher than previous boom times. Since I've been around, it's a bit lower, uh, but still 3.8%, which is higher than other states. Uh, and we, uh, we did, in the past, peg uh, increases in wages at um, CPI. But as it's very hard to forecast, as Brad indicated in this economy, and we have persistently, Treasury persistently forecast inflation higher than is realized. We started this with, we pegged inflation, we, uh, we predicted inflation was 2.75, it came in at 1.8. Then we lowered the uh, inflation target to 2.5, came at 1.1. So what we've done is, uh, we, because we have a whole raft of EBAs that we're going to negotiate run up to the, right up to the election, uh, so I expect honeybees to be following me around in the campaign like the nurses did last time. They added a lot of color to it, to the campaign. Uh, but uh, we've now, the inflation during the December quarter was actually run at 1.3%. The forecast by Treasury is be run at one5 so we have a whole raft of EBAs, and the starting point for negotiation is that the increase for throughout the period of the EBA will be 1.5%. Now, this is difficult for people who are used to 8.8, .8, or under us, first term 6.9, or more recently, 3.8% increases. This hard form, it's a small number, but it has to be live within your means. All I can say to the many public servants, the objective is to maintain your high real incomes in real terms, uh, and that we expect to continue relative to other states, uh, to also at the same time to allow us to do that to guarantee wage security, and wage security, employment security is an important thing in this environment, uh, and to maintain the quality and uh, support services through the essential services of Western Australia. It will be a challenge, but it's one that we have put in place. It's one that we have to do. Uh, in the private sector, compare the private and public sector in Western Australia. Uh, the red is the public sector. Uh, blue is the private sector. There have been some, as you well know, uh, slowing of uh, the rate of growth in the private sector wages over the last few years. In fact, if you look over the term, the hashed area is the differential between the private and public sector. Again, it shows that the public sector has done well off this growth phase. Uh, we, as a matter of policy, one we do not run from, committed huge investments in the quality and staffing levels and pay of our public sector. And even though for a period the private sector is really booming in wages, the, the public sector actually did better than the private sector. That's what you have to do, adjust. The private sector is doing this. It's not easy in the, uh, in the public sector. Uh, things don't quite work that way. There's no bottom line and it's very political, but this is called necessary. This is what good government is all about. Asset sales. We have, uh, I think some other ones talked about uh, debt levels and they are high. They're about $29 billion going towards $39 billion. 29 is not too high giving the, uh, the investment in there. As I indicate in uh, just a minute, overwhelmingly, one business has absorbed most of that debt. That's Western Power. Represents 30% of the total stock of debt in the state. You add Water Corp to it, uh, that's about 50% between those two businesses, both in terms of stock of debt and growth of debt. Uh, and then if you add uh, Main Roads and some other things to it, most of the debt, particularly in the first term, was used to build the facilities to house a 30% increase in population. That's what we did. That's what you do in the accumulation. But that's high, largely because of the collapse of revenue and the deficits that flow from that. And so we have a asset sales program. Start small. Treasury has very few people, if anybody in Treasury, actually sold an asset because most of them are quite young. Uh, we haven't sold any assets for a while. So we had to develop a team, and we started off with the fruit and vegetable stands at uh, Canning Vale Markets. It's in my electorate. And uh, it's actually 40% of the fruit and vegetable. Uh, it's a very good asset, and it's su supplies and services and industry horticulture that has huge potential in this state. So we put it on the market, uh, and it worked out a butte. It wasn't just about getting money. That's always important. 
Uh, but it was also about making the issue about asset recycling. We needed to build the uh, market. We needed to particularly build and own and move it to Canning Vale 20, 30 years ago. We needed to, to settle it down, but we don't need to own it now. And we sold it to the people who use it, the users and growers and, and sellers of fruit and vegetables at the market itself. And they are and committed to expanding the facility. That's, that's good policy. It's also provided about $135 million to reduce debt. The next one is Utah Point, which is a multi-user facility up in the Port of Port Hedland, provided junior miners. We built that oh, about five, six years ago for $305 million total cost. Uh, private sector couldn't, wanted to build it. Uh, it had, it's technically difficult because it relates to BHP and we don't want to hurt BHP. Uh, and uh, we bedded it down. It took us a while to get throughput through it. It's full capacity. There are some issues with the users. Iron ore prices are low. Uh, but we don't need to own this thing anymore. I might add, there are 15, there are 19 uh, wharfage facilities in the Port of Port Helen. 15 are owned by the private sector. So private ownership of wharfs is not an unusual phenomenon. Uh, that was passed through the uh, lower house of parliament this week. We also and it's very much into the sale of the port of Fremantle. That's a big one. Uh, and we're also doing things with Key Start's book. We're probably going to uh, securitize or equivalent securitize about half that book at 2.4 billion. Uh, and Forest Products Commission, we're looking at it, but the recent fires have burnt a few trees down there. It's not worth as much. Uh, and uh, now the discussion is about Western power. I'm not going to give you any runaways with this, but the government is, is considering Western power. Mark Barnabar mentioned that uh, in his speech. He used to be chairman of uh, Western power. He knows a bit about it. Uh, and uh, all I can say is this, a couple things, that Western power represents 30% of the stock of debt. It has been the major source of borrowings from the state. It is a regulated monopoly. That is, the state is regulated by the ERA. We're moving it over to the national regulator. Uh, and uh, that uh, uh, the state has almost no control over uh, its asset in terms of how much it invests, what rate of return it can get, and uh, uh, the prices that it levies onto it. It has very little control over this asset and really doesn't. And most, and about more than half of these assets around Australia are privately owned. Some, like Victoria, has been privately owned for 20 some years. Uh, and uh, one of the issues is will privatization lead to higher prices? This is a study, I think, by EY. Uh, it's simple, but you'll compare the public with the private, the privately owned one, which are, they're regulated by the same authority to the same standards, both as safety, uh, in terms of reliability, uh, in terms of rates of return, the regulation are identical, and the regulator is the same, same law, same, law, same act. And uh, Victoria and South Australia are some, well, in, anywhere between $500 to uh, $100 uh, per year cheaper. Uh, I might add, I announced, uh, well, Western Power announced, really, they led the thing that they're undertaking a reform agenda because we're moving Western Power to the AER, to the national regulator. And the national regulator has been tougher and tougher. And once they assess that, they're going to have to, in the next regulatory regime, reduce their costs operating and capital in the vicinity of 25 to 30 percent. So Western Power announced a reform agenda that will pull $1.6 billion out of the cost of Western Power over the next four years. And that has nothing to do with privatization. That has to do meet what you expect your regulator is going to provide you. So we have in Western Power, it's the biggest asset, as Mark uh, indicated. It's been absorbing most of our debt. It's a live issue out there, whether we should own it or not. And I might add, as, uh, uh, as, uh, uh, as indicated earlier, it is under technological change, more, even more ferocious than taxi cabs. Uh, it's being Ubered. Uh, and uh, it's under technological challenge. And I think they have a great future, uh, poles and wires, but it's going to take a degree because I think you're going to have more electrons transferred, not less, uh, though microgrids will do some, uh, pull it back somewhat. But it's going to require policy and inv 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 uh, innovativeness beyond public sector can actually provide. 
Uh, GST. Uh, I won't bore you with this, and I, uh, with this, but we're being dudded seriously. Uh, some people say, well, you should have seen it coming. What the Grants Commission does is takes the, a big block of money, now it's from the GST, it used to be just from the Commonwealth, and distributes it across the states so that all states and territories can provide the same level of good, goods and services irrespective of the cost structures. Big socialist mechanism. Uh, and uh, the problem is it pays everybody to stay put. So during this last boom, did how many people come, came from unemployed Northwest Tasmania? Very few. Very few are South Australia. Uh, we, we had to take people from overseas. Uh, very inefficient. But what it did is that it also treats our iron ore income as manna from heaven without any costs associated with it and redistributed to the other states. So you have Tasmania and South Australia glibly bragging about budget surpluses. They don't know where it's come from. It came from us. Uh, and you know what's going to happen? Uh, and I think my good friend Scott Morrison is experiencing that now. Uh, he, this has happened to us in three years' time. It's happened to Scott now. In three years' time, it's going to happen to Tasmania and South Australia. You know what I'm going to say? Nick off. <laughs> I told you so. Enjoy yourself. <laughs> a and we're going to compete for the submarines. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but just to finish, Western Australia went through the best times. It was hard to get it done. Now we're adjusting to a different time. I don't know if we're at the bottom or not. Uh, we will recover, but the good times when we got all that investment done was a different time and important to the state and set it up for the future. What we are doing now of driving productivity improvements in the private sector, that's, that's your job, uh, and to the public sector is as if not more important than the accumulation phase. And uh, it's a bit more difficult, uh, but that's what we have to do. Thanks very much.